Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mitchell Lepp. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is Tony Toast. I'm a screenwriter, television producer, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. So this is fantastic. You have done so many fantastic things, and I can't wait to get into it. But mostly I want to shut the fuck up, because sitting next to me is another screenwriter and someone that, you know, you know I love you. Yes, of <laughs> Hilliard Guest. By the way, you should check out Hilliard's show. It's called Screenwriter's Rant Room. I imagine you're going to get pitched at some point. But I'm going to have him on the show. <laughs> <laughs> you don't but, know it yet. But yeah. Yeah. Wait until I make a fool out of myself. Right. Then, if you guys don't know Tony's work, uh, you've seen it headlined on Netflix before because he's one of the main dudes from Longmire. There is a long resume of things. Right. You have a lot of projects. We'll talk about those. But just super stoked to have you on. Oh, and thanks, first inaugural uh, podcast. So, and we worked a long time coming, too. We had to be patient. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm just a little, little flaky life work. Well, oh, being busy is good. Stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was, I was just, I didn't interrupt you. I was just yeah. telling, um, I just had the co-EP of Flash on my show the other day, and we were trying to do it for like the last year. Mm-hmm. And, and I told him, he was like, oh, man, I'm, I apologize. And I was like, don't apologize. It always works out at the perfect timing regardless. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. I mean? and, and, and like, right. if you're working, I want you working. Like, <laughs> Make that money. Yeah. I actually, I actually, uh, I got the big time Dan, uh, Danny Trejo. I've been working on Ooh, Danny Trejo for oh, a long nice. time. Nice. And uh, the lower I got in the... Uh, the PR structure, like the more like they're like, no, no, no. And so it came down to like the one day of the week I can't do it is Tuesday at 9 a.m. And I I do face to face. So, you know, let me know. And and everything was good until we got to the like, she's like Tuesday, 9 a.m. Phone call 30 minutes. And I'm like, none of that. None of that is what I do. We're going to have to pass. So I got to pass. I had to pass on on Danny Trejo. Well, just this once. That, yeah. that would be an interesting, because, I mean, he's Mr. Restaurant Tour now. He yeah. He's really Those. became an icon. I mean, he's successful. I love it. Donuts yeah. and yeah. tacos. Yeah. So are, are you going to have uh, Tony's Tacos? Tony's Tacos? Tony's uh, Taco Toast? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I No, I'm not. No. Um, well. But uh, it's a... Uh, maybe it'd be a one-man show. Yeah. Could, uh, <laughs> so are you, are you a poet? Or are you a screenwriter? Uh, I am. Uh, I am, I used to recall. Uh, I used to call myself a recovering poet. Okay. Which is kind of a shitty thing. Um, for a long time, I was a poet. I kind of got the poetry bug when I was about nineteen. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was in community college. First, I wanted to um, write song lyrics. You know, I was really into grunge, sure, punkish stuff. Wanted to write better lyrics. And then I then I just kind of got into the words and stuff, and I uh, got a little bit of a religious, almost conversion to literature around that time. Mm-hmm. You know, I kind of, I grew up, I grew up, you know, pretty uh, Where from? blue collar. Um, was born in Missouri Ozarks, grew mm-hmm. up in a small town, uh, kind of at the base of Mount Rainier in Washington State. Mm-hmm. Um, so kind of trailer park to trailer park type of thing. Right. Um, nobody in my family got to college, <laughs> uh, graduated high school. Started working at a pickle factory, realized that was maybe not uh, what great. I wanted to do. What a great story. It could have been a deal, man. See? <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so I started taking classes at community college. Took a creative writing class because, you know, I kind of wanted to write songs like the Meat Puppets and, sure. uh, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And then uh, I kind of discovered like Franz Kafka, right. got into movies, then mm-hmm. went to this strange Christian, very right wing uh, <laughs> college in the Ozarks called College of the Ozarks, which uh, was like if your family was under a certain income level, you mm-hmm. could work on campus and that would pay for your uh, tuition. So that was really the option for me. And so I went there and then they weirdly at that time had a great English faculty and then some other kind of uh, Ozark art weirdos. And so I kind of discovered... Uh, and, you know, William Butler Yeats and Flannery O'Connor mm-hmm. and Mel, but like this, this whole world kind of when I was about teen or so, uh, I had no idea that this really existed, right. like this world of, and so then I just kind of, um, I kind of just devoted like, kind of like the next 
12 or 13 years of my life to poetry. Um, really? Applied to Crave writing programs. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I got into some good ones, but I couldn't, I literally couldn't afford the drive <laughs> yeah. uh, wow. to get there. And couldn't get enough overtime shifts at the pickle factory. Yeah. <laughs> well, th- th- yeah, at this point I was working uh, as a... Uh, well, I was cleaning condos and uh, working the night man at a hotel and, then, you know, washing dishes and stuff in Branson, Missouri. <laughs> yeah. But I could afford to uh, go down to the University of Arkansas's creative writing mm-hmm. program, which ended up being, again, like, it worked out. That was the perfect place to go. It was a yeah. great program. So I did a four-year MFA there. My And then coming out of there, like, my master's thesis, I, it got published as my first book and won the, uh, mm-hmm. like, the week before I graduated, I found out I won this thing called the Walt Whitman Award. Right, so I got right, a right. first book of poetry, so that was cool. Uh, but then I'd, I'd fallen in love right at that time uh, with my now wife, Lee, who's from Arkansas. She was going to North Carolina for um, a political science PhD. I decided to tag along with her. And then, again, I was kind of doing working as a barista, working, uh, <laughs> counting traffic and stuff for the city. Of, I love uh, to hear Capitol people's Hill. hustles on yeah. the way. Yeah. 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 I love and, it. I love it. And, uh, and then she decided to switch, um, from political science to business for a PhD. And I decided I would go back and do a PhD as well. And so we both ended up at Duke at the same time. Mm. So I did a, a, wrote a dissertation on Ezra Pound mostly. Yeah. Uh, his poetics. <laughs> Published another poetry book, wrote a book, and published it about Johnny Cash. Yeah. Uh, finished the PhD. We moved to Seattle for a for her postdoc, and I got uh, a tenure track creative writing job. Walked in on my first uh, faculty meeting and realized, oh my God, I've done some huge mistake. I Uh-oh. do not want to be in academia. Wow. Anymore. I do not want to be in this world. What have I done? I yeah. love it. I love and it. so I, uh, I switched over to, to screenwriting kind of like right then was that a fluke it, it was well i was I, it in your it was always in my head like uh, okay. back back uh, way back in the day like i you know when i was in the ozarks i really wanted to go to film school mm-hmm. um film nuts and but i just you know the finance the geography just the otherworldliness of it. it's just like right. it's not for people like me it's a nice daydream to have <laughs> i'd have i don't know the first the first step to take to get into that industry mm-hmm. Because uh, I never knew anybody who was in it, didn't know, yeah. like, I didn't know any of the paths. I, I guess I was too chicken shit to just drive out to L.A. and or New York and do it. Because like I, was like, well, I want to do that, but I can do this creative writing thing, and at least you know, I, I've kind of come to think that creative writing MFA programs are a little bit of a sham, a little bit. Mm. You know, it's a little bit of a pyramid scheme. But the nice thing about it is, like, if you're an undergraduate and you finish, you're like, well, it's not a huge step to go to grad school. Like, at least, you know, and then, you know, and then, you know, most people, they get really in debt and they realize there's no jobs and like, oh, crap. Yeah. It's such a leap from being, a, you know, poor undergraduate in a rural setting to, like, going to a big city. Like, mm-hmm. I just couldn't do that. So, anyways, the, so it was always something I wanted to do. The the, the weird roundabout way that I did it um, – in a lot of ways, it's luck, circumstance. When I was at University of Arkansas, one of the MFA students there is a guy named Nick Pizzolato, who went on to do True Detective. And, but we were there. He was a fiction writer. I was a It's poet. not a very good show, Pete. Yeah. There's all kind of Emmys. No one it's nothing. Yeah, nothing. <laughs> it's a small time. I haven't heard about it. Right. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we got to be buddies. And then we were both in North Carolina at the same time, mm-hmm. um, and we were still pretty good friends. And his novel got optioned, mm-hmm. and he wanted to, he wanted to write the script for it, uh, um, but the agents who'd optioned is just like, well, you have to have some kind of script sample to be mm-hmm. able to really do that. And so he kind of went away, wrote a bunch of scripts in a couple in a short period of time, and one of them including like the True Detective pilot, but a bunch wow. of other ones. Um, and yeah. and um, he kind of. He was on that level at that yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. Wow. He just kind of, because uh, I mean, he's, he, I mean, he's obviously a very smart guy, but also tell, a, tell us why that's wild, though. That's that's interesting. It usually, ta- and you can relate. Yeah. It usually takes a good amount of scripts before you can write a script like True Detective. I mean, it's just so smart, so clever. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's just breaking all the barriers. It's pushing through things that we've seen today. It's. Yeah. It's on another level, you know. It, yeah, it, yeah, it's not. It's not just a. It's not just a procedural. It's right. not an anti-procedural. It's almost like this meta-procedural where mm-hmm. it's. It's about the crime, but it's also about the stories we tell ourselves about 
about ourselves and about right. crime and about our place in the universe. It's just and operating it's character, like real. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so, so that's, you know, so he, he sent that to the agents and they flipped out mm. and he got, you know, he got a staff writing job at the killing, got some pilot deals. And so, and then he's just, cause we were both at this point, just kind of desperate to get out of academia for mm-hmm. our own separate reasons. Just yeah. like, we're not good fits here. And he's just like, you know, like the, the water's really fun, nice over here. Like, you know, <laughs> it's a nine seventy nine, isn't it? Yeah. Um, write some scripts. <clears throat> if they don't suck, I'll give them to my agents and say that you're, you know, a pretty sane guy, right. and and we'll see what yeah. happens. And so, uh, I tried. Uh, so I wrote my. I tried writing my first script, which I was, I was going to try to do, like, The Wire in the Ozarks. So were you, were you specking nice. scripts at the time? I was spec- yeah. Harvard. So it, this is just to, to pass along to the agent. Sure. So this is, like, I, I'm, I'm, at this point, I'm, um, I, I'm, I'm right at the cusp of starting this professor job. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I have, I have a couple months kind of um, uh, buffer. And, uh, and it, it was kind of okay. And, and, and he's like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll send it to my my agents, I think this is probably good enough to get you staff, but we'll see. Right. And then I'm just like, no, 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 don't, don't, don't share that yet. Like if I'm going to put myself out there, it's got to be something I feel like a hundred percent on. Right. So I scrapped that, went back and, and wrote a, um, uh, a pilot that never been produced, but it's mm-hmm. called Tangle Eye. It was kind of to do a, um, Clint Eastwood mm. kind of, um, man with no name kind of spaghetti Western, but in the uh, rural County that I grew up in, which abutted a, uh, uh Indian reservation, the uh, oh, uh, Indian reservation. Mm-hmm. And so I, I kind of like just wrote that in like a week and a half. And I should, it was in you already. It was in me. It tapped it. It was before I was kind of on the outside, kind of trying to write approximating what I was seeing on TV. Mm-hmm. This time I decided like, okay, like, I I I, uh, I got more of myself into it. Mm-hmm. Some of my issues it was set in a in a in the terrain I grew up with. Mm-hmm. Lots of people that I and so it just it had it had life to it. I showed it to my wife and she's like, yeah, like this is you should send this. This mm-hmm. is like and yeah, I want to so, read that one. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, so he sent that to his agents. They loved it. They became my agents. Mm-hmm. And I was living in Seattle at the time. And then it was weird because like it was very good fortune. Um, they flew. They they pass it around the industry a little bit. A manager who's still my manager, Guy McCassidy at Management 360, mm-hmm. who's um, one of the one of the top companies around town. Um, mm-hmm. He he liked it a lot, so he wanted he wanted to work with me. And they set up a bunch of meetings, and, uh, and so I flew in for like a, a week and a half of meetings, and and it was crazy. So I was meeting with executives, production companies, what have you, and then by the time I flew, I, I came home and I, I got the uh, the Longmire job. Hmm. Um, out of those meetings, I had weirdly like pitched and sold a pilot to a, uh, a studio. And then, uh, the tangle eye, the spec, um, got a pilot deal with a blind script deal at another, by the way, Pete, studio. none of this ever uh-huh. happened. Uh-huh. Right. <laughs> and yeah. so that, that, There's only some dude out of town. Who uh-huh. yeah. shit. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was just insanely. So like I came back home and quit the professor job. Yeah. And so I was like, well, I guess I'm the screenwriter now. Mm-hmm. And, but we press pause there because yeah, like you're saying, mm-hmm. th- that's impossible. So how did you know the language of screenwriting? I mean, okay, you're a poet, you're yeah. a PhD, you know, yeah. writing, but I, I, I know, I mean, I, I'd, well, I was, like in, as a teenager, I was obsessed with Quentin Tarantino. Um, mm-hmm. I read all of his scripts. I would read scripts. Like actually, when I was like some of the poetry that I would do, um, I was a pretty, um, I guess, kind of experimental poet. Like sometimes I would write poems in the form of screenplays. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and so I like that form a lot as because it's so imagistic and as a way to get outside of some typical poetic. Um, I don't know, kind of typical poetic moves is mm-hmm. to like, you know, bring that sensibility. So like, like I, I kind of knew the form, but also I think weirdly poetry and screenwriting maybe in a way, um, match up even better than, uh, didn't I just tell you that mm-hmm. I, and, so yeah. I just told him this yeah. literally about Did 10 it. minutes before you came yeah. in yeah. that I was writing spoken word before I ever started writing oh, yeah, screenplays, yeah. you know, 20 years ago. Yeah. And so I totally understand. I will say one little thing. Yeah. Everybody that I know, everybody who's successful, wrote a script that everybody told them not to write yeah. or that they wrote from their gut. Oh, 100%. And that's the script they made. Every single person. It, it, really? my, my Every entire, single my, person. My entire, my, <clears throat> what I have, you know, like my, you know, my kind of anonymous working career right. um, is built on, on three scripts 
all on spec, mm. all just my my things mm-hmm. written. Like you know, like I've done other stuff for for money for on assignment and stuff, mm-hmm. and I, that pay that's paid the bills and that's been rewarding. Mm-hmm. But my entire it's it's the 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 th- the the only things that ever get brought up in meetings or the reason people want to meet with me or right. possibly work with me is these small little. Uh, and sometimes you never sell them, yeah. but they are right. just your calling they, they card. They can be your best friends because right. like, it's it's your chance. Like if you don't have to develop with somebody, mm-hmm. it could be your voice for better or worse. Mm-hmm. But it's your voice, it's your obsessions, your passion. Yeah, it might not get produced, but right. people then know. Oh, that's who this person is. Right. Mm-hmm. And 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 that was, I I kind of lucked into that. I mean, that wasn't that I, I was. I kind of didn't know any better mm-hmm. um, at the beginning, but then I kind of had to relearn it because I thought I thought I was going to be cagey and. And like you can't outsmart the industry, no. you can't anticipate where things are going. You've kind of like you've got to kind of you know hope that the stars align that what you're passionate about. You know, like like and, uh, I have friends like breaking in or trying to break in, and it's just like if if you have a hundred people who think your script is pretty good, nothing's going to happen. <laughs> if you have two or three people think like this is the best thing I've read all year. Mm-hmm. Something might happen. Right. Right. You know, like that's the difference. And you have to, t- you know, and maybe 96 people think, Oh, but fuck, I don't, I, I'm sorry about the cussing. Oh, but, uh, no, so no, you no, should no. say okay, fuck okay, all you okay, want. Okay. okay, okay good, good. <laughs> We're uh, grown folks over here. Okay. okay good. Never know. Never know. Um, uh, but yeah, so I mean, even if like 50, uh, 80, 90 people hate it. If those three people think that's the best thing they've read all year, mm-hmm. they will, you know, cause what you, you need is you need somebody either to think, this script is rocket fuel for my career. Right. Or this thing I believe in so much, I will risk <clears throat> my rep or uh, actual finances to get this thing made. And, yeah. and like pr- pretty professional or pretty good or good enough um, isn't going to do that. Yeah. And so I think it's the, uh, and the, I think the, like I'm not talented or smart enough to, to write that kind of script if it's not an obsession or personal or very, mm-hmm. yeah. The, the whole thing was just, I, I kind of I, I lucked into so oh, we were talking about the connection between poetry and script writing and mm-hmm. and yeah so like learning the form like to me like well, it's different spoken word which also probably has but I always did mine and I was telling it was yeah. always in a story form okay yeah I always told a yeah. story I didn't yeah. even realize I, yeah. I just went back like six months ago I had a big pitch meeting at this big company and there was an element of poetry in there. So yeah. in my pitch, yeah. I did this fucking full on spoken oh, word. It yeah. was beautiful. Yeah. And, but I had went back and looked at some of my old stuff and went, Oh my God, I'm telling. Yeah. I was completely one act three, you know, had yeah. everyone, everything in there. So yeah. yeah. No, no, that's so, so <laughs> cause I mean, that, and the, the cool thing about this, cause like my, my stuff was very much, um, not spoken word is very kind of imagistic, mm-hmm. which was good because, uh, cause I think they, they both have, they can lend themselves to screenwriting because, like for me, what it is, poetry was trying to create a certain kind of emotional state or psychic state in right. a reader through a series of images and the juxtaposition of images. And in a lot of ways, screenwriting is that. If you can, you know, like the best scripts have as little. Uh, I think sometimes, and this could be my own like mm-hmm. uh, loving of like westerns or samurai films where there's right. not a lot of dialogue, but it's like the it's the um, very exact selection of images in a certain order, in a certain juxtaposition, mm-hmm. create an emotional and state. And it's clean on the page. It's yeah. beautiful, too. Yeah. And, right. But then, but the, you know, but the hardest thing for me actually was, and this connects to, with your spoken word experience, mm-hmm. was like, I, I had always written for a, a kind of a silent voice, mm-hmm. like, you know, like not reading out loud, not, you know, but to, to kind of read and take in, but while, mm-hmm. while you're writing, and this is the thing, I, one of the big jumps I had to take, plus like learning narrative, right. um, was <laughs> to, um, to learn how to write for the spoken voice so like it doesn't sound like writing it sounds like people you know like composing at the point of utterance which mm-hmm. is also called talking you right. know but it's and it like, should be a little poetic it should, though. It should right. be poetic but right. it shouldn't be overdetermined correct you know and so like that's and so then i had to just learn okay like my process has to be i write shit and then i say it out loud mm-hmm. a, lo- a lot and then if it sounds weird it sounds like a speech instead of right. somebody's talk that well then I need to go back in there and and and, and mess with the rhythms and, and all that kind do of stuff. Do you act when you do that? Mm-hmm. Uh I, especially like Longmire, you've got yeah. established characters. Are yeah. you like I'm well, ranch? Well, 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 <laughs> <laughs> and I kinda of swagger around. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, play dress up. <laughs> right. Now he's got his cowboy boots Speak Philadelphia you know? to yeah. me. That's the line I heard today. <laughs> now I'm gonna be Vic. Uh, uh, Katie, Katie would slap me if I was doing um, her voice like that. Uh, I don't really get, get in the character so much. I mean, it's easier like later seasons of Longmire because 
the actors had such specific voices, I could hear it. I'd right. say it out loud. You could write them in like a day and, or two. And, and I could, like, and I'd do yeah. like, you know, Robert Taylor is, Robert Taylor is Walt Lawmary, like a little bit deeper. And, yeah. You know, like, and like make sure that it sounds, yeah, that sounds right. But I think it's just kind of, just literally just kind of like saying it out loud and hearing it. Rhythms. And, and just, yeah, rhythms, mm-hmm. feeling that it's, it, you know, it doesn't go on too long. Like I, right. I, I would, I would write, too many compounds. Mm-hmm. That was my next question. Mm-hmm. Especially coming out of out of academia into sure. screenwriting, like right. no, p- folks usually don't talk like that. You know, <laughs> they usually they have little pauses in right. there, or, or they're it's have staccato a, almost. Yeah, sometimes. a lot right. of times, you know, right. and, and and so like that's the thing, figuring out that rhythm, and then but once you know the actors. Uh, Voices, it becomes so much easier, and you can write towards that. You know, mm-hmm. like like Lou Diamond Phillips has a very specific way Ooh. of speaking. And yeah, yeah, I had this now. question teed up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I, I love Longmire. It's fantastic. And I got obsessed with Lou Diamond Phillips' character, and I didn't know if this is something that you did, something <laughs> he did, or something that I completely imagined. Yeah. But to me, he's like Data. Yeah. Never used contractions. Right. Very, the way he spoke. Yeah. Am I crazy? Not crazy at all. Uh, one contraction a season. Okay. Really? One, one contraction a season. Yeah. And but that was derived from Craig Johnson's novels. Um, huh. Okay. Of his Henry Standing Bear, um, uh, in Craig Johnson's iteration of him in the novels, uh, did not. Uh, and and I think part of the idea was that he would one he's a very careful, very exact in his words, but also like he would speak uh, the white man's language with more precision and exactness than the white man himself in a way. It's a, it's a way of almost kind right. of a character who's been. You know, in an early age, probably, you know, in a way against the will, against mm-hmm. his will, indoctrinated in a non-native language. Mm-hmm. And so you can either kind of take a victim mentality of that, or you can say, I'll turn that uh, to my advantage, and I'll take your language, and I will um, use it um, with more acumen than you're capable of. And so I think that's... Taking like, the power away from them. Yeah, yeah, a lot, right. lot of ways, yeah, right. kind of taking that, right. that back. And so that that was, a, you know, like, well, sometimes, I mean, like, we, we would have to go through a lot, because, like... You don't, you don't, you want it to be like, wait, I think, I think Henry talks like that. Is that true? Or is that just me? Because like, you don't want it to be so, so overt that it Mm -hmm. becomes comical or it becomes exaggerated and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's that fine line and it's tricky sometimes. And you know, like it would take several passes to kind of get it where Mm -hmm. at least we felt like it was, it was both specific to Henry, but it also felt like a person and not a um, contrived uh, persona. Right. Yeah. That's fascinating. I've been dying to ask that question forever. So uh, if thank that's you. been developing your characters and making them, you give them that voice and you start to, yeah, you like, start to hear it. Yeah. You know? No, a hundred percent. Like, right. you know, like the, I think there's a, you know, kind of a, um, a truism that is pretty freaking true that like, uh, a really well-written script that you cover the uh, characters' names and you know who's speaking right. because they have specific voices, they mm-hmm. have a specific point of view, they have mannerisms, they have their own language. That was a lot of me learning. Um, you know, like I, I jumped in uh, season one writing for Longmire. I had basically written one script up to that point. You right. Know? One of them like, happened I'm, to be someone who lives right next to someone on an Indian reservation, which is I'm, I'm perfect, still tripping but... off the fact that your spec yeah. just so happened to fit right... <laughs> it's timing, though. Oh. It's timing, oh, wow. though. Oh, yeah. Timing, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very lucky. I mean, it's like... Um, yeah, because like they're, right. you know, like is set in Wyoming. I grew up in Washington State. Pretty similar mm-hmm. landscape. Mm-hmm. Pretty similar demographics. Uh, yeah, set next to Cheyenne Reservation. I grew up next to the uh, Muckle Street Reservation. Right, so right. there's... And, and, I, and I just happened... To in trying to write what I knew or what I was passionate about, I wanted to claim that landscape, and that happened to be what they're looking for. I right. mean, but there's also other things like there was two other writers that would have gotten my position, but they uh, they got other jobs, and so I was choice number oh, three. Wow, right. you know, yeah. Uh, and so like, I mean, there's just that of it too. It's not like I came in, <laughs> Mr. Unicorn, and must hire. It's just like, okay, um, <clears throat> plan A fell yeah. through, plan B fell through. Right. Let's try this poet weird from out of town as plan C he'll yeah. be cheap at least right, you know? right. And but so then it's like me jumping in and that's like uh, Judge Harry from Night Court he's like <laughs> I was the 47th guy they called on a Sunday I was just home oh Harry Anderson was yeah yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Wow. yeah. But I mean like that's the story of the judge yeah you know, oh, not, okay. not, not okay. Harry not himself Harry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. yeah 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 oh, that's funny oh. yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so I mean like first season was actually like me just uh, jumping in and, and trying to fake it yeah mm-hmm. and just trying to survive just trying to like were you were you were you vocal in the room? Were you quiet, or did it take you a minute to figure I was, that out? I was I was I was very like I'm 
the writers' rooms mm-hmm. because because I'd spent you know like um, the Arc Assignment Fate program is a four year workshop heavy program, so yeah. the writers' room felt like a less dysfunctional, more friendly writers' workshop. Oh, interesting! And so I felt right at home, like okay, probably yeah. too at home. <laughs> you being feet up, chilling. Yeah, right? exactly. No, showrunner, <laughs> let me tell you what the story should be. Yeah, uh, I mean, but you know. Uh, and so I, 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 I can be pretty chatty in the, in the writer's room. Okay. So, but I mean, but the, the Longmire writer's room, I mean, they're saints. Uh, Greer Shepard, she's my, uh, mm-hmm. really my mentor person who hired me, kind of mentored me, kind of taught me both television writing and television mm-hmm. producing along with uh, John Coveney and Hunt Baldwin, who are the wow. uh, creators of it. Right. They, they really, their writer's room was very untraditional. It was the three of them. Greer's a non-writing showrunner. Mm-hmm. Uh, she really guides the ship. And then Hunt and John are a writing team who are the head writers, also executive producers, creators of it. Mm-hmm. And then there's only one other writer in the that room at a time. Uh, just per episode, because especially the first uh, season or two is very much of a procedural engine. Oh, okay. So you come in, break you come in, break your episode for two weeks, mm-hmm. go off, outline it, do notes, do all that process. Then you come back again for your episode. Oh, so you guys aren't just in a room every day like you yeah. guys are. Yeah. So okay. so so yeah. So maybe like you know at the start of the season, we, the whole writer team and really was just myself and two other like staff writers. Okay. Um, would be in for you know we kind of brainstorm for the season or mostly download from Greer and Hunt and John mm-hmm. what the season was going to be about. We'd make some pitches. Sure. And then and then you just come in for your episode. And so like that as the show got more serialized, that that presented some problems and stuff, but also as the sh- as the show got more serialized like, you know, um seasons especially like seasons 4 and 5 when we got to Netflix at this point I'm 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 a producer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've gone from, you know, freelance in the first uh, right. season or so mm-hmm. to like be more involved. So I'm in more of these discussions of what's right. what's going on on prepping episodes and doing doing all that stuff. And and so like Where did big, you guys shoot? By the way. Uh New Mexico. Okay. Uh, hey. Gorgeous. Oh, it's oh, oh, my God. God. It was awesome. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. like um <clears throat> the northern part of New Mexico, mm-hmm. we'd stay in Santa Fe, that's where the production offices are, where our stages were, and then usually we'd kind of wander north a bit to find uh, the different locations. Right. Um it was on a uh, on, on deadly class how how many Vancouver. Day- Vancouver. Yeah, they're shooting my episode right now. Oh really? Which I'm a little annoyed because oh, I thought no. I was gonna go shoot my episode. Yeah. Well, Bastard. no, I mean that's. <laughs> I said it. Yeah, I, 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 I didn't make it on set until my second season on Lomar. Um, <clears throat> it's trick. I mean, it's tri- I mean that was our whole. Did you ever get in a scene me. at all? I mean, you huh? look like you could be in Longmire right now, just sitting uh-huh. in your day to day Tony <laughs> self. You know, like I'm Jeff the bartender. Yeah, no, I, 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 I did. I, I did show up in. Um, well, originally, because I'm, I'm a big pro wrestling fan. Oh, um, that's and, sweet. And, I, and I wrote like some backyard wrestling in an episode. <laughs> I was going to be. I was going to be the ref. Uh, <laughs> all right. We even had a shirt for me and stuff. But then I, I had to. I had to go back uh, to L.A. for something, so I didn't make that episode. <laughs> yeah. And then a later episode that season, I was a cowboy who had to go pee. Yeah, uh, and then I walk in in the scene, and Cassidy Freeman, who plays Katie, grabs me and shoves me out of the uh, bathroom. <laughs> and so, like that was my fantastic. My That's cute. Um, yeah. He got his sad card. The end of the <laughs> <day>. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so that's. Um, but yeah, so like I mean, is is crazy. And then like learning how to, I don't know, like a deadly class. Do you know like how many days you guys shoot for? An I episode? think they do. Some are seven, some are nine. Depends. Yeah. yeah, depends. Yeah, so like like Longmire is seven uh, days per episode, right. and, and and which is like only two of them on stage. So like the like this crew was amazing because like we'd be at maybe like three locations a day. So that means like you you run out. You hit the scene. You, the actors got to nail it right away. Mm-hmm. They got to get it, and then everybody jumps in the trucks and drives to the next scene, and, and everything. Which set is up. a nightmare. It's I a, can't even on imagine. On most it. others, you most, do shows, not, most shows you can maybe do one right. move. You do not want to move. Um, yeah. Move no, is you, the you worst to, thing. To yeah, do. you try to set it. Right. Try to set it up so you can spend right. the whole day. Well, anything location. can happen once everything's broke down and you're in route. Like someone could break the rank. Exactly. You know, exactly. Yeah, everything, everything, or then you fall behind. Right. On the first scene, and then like either you got to catch it up uh, somewhere. That's so why they right. all drive together because if somebody's like, oh, I'm going to drive, you're like, oh, yeah, shit. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so anyway, so like there, that, that was, um, there's many reasons why um, Longmire was a lucky break, but like, the amazing people to work with, really cool cast. I love mm-hmm. the show. It was a land, it, it, was, it was a great entry point too because like, right. I think one of the big reasons that they, how many, they, how many did you guys do a, a season? How many? Um, did, um, uh, 10 episodes a season except mm-hmm. for season two when we did 13. Okay, right. Which, uh, um, what was a, like, that was, doesn't sound like a lot, but that, 
that that almost it's broke, a big broke jump us. from ten, it's especially a big with jump that small rise. Right, like I, right. I, you know, it was my second season. I wrote four episodes. Wow. Uh, in that season, and, and it was like just quit. Like you'd be working on two episodes at the same time, mm-hmm. and you've got like you know like twenty four hours to write you know thirty pages of yeah. of decent scenes mm-hmm. like that. You're just ah. Um, but uh, nice green envelopes though. Trust yeah. Me. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, no, totally. They, they told me like one of the the main reasons they hired me was just because I'm from that world because mm-hmm. they needed you know like most writers you know like a lot of them come from an Ivy League right. or from sure. you know a little bit more sheltered kind of world and I, I grew up in in small towns in the right. West in Trailer and, Park. I mean, tra- yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, and I love love you know like we had a whole. You know, like the trailer park that we had in Longmire where Vic ended up, like I modeled that on the uh, one of the trailer parks um, that, that sure. I grew up in. And mm. so like actually like a lot of the characters that populated that trailer park are all just based on uh, people I know. Yeah. And so like it was just like my own little like Tony's little Petri dish in a way of like, you know, it's like there's an older lady that like my, gr- my grandma who I was very close to had passed like two years before. And so I I basically invented a character with her name that mm. had all of her traits basically and then like we cast an actress that was just like like I was on set almost in tears the whole oh, time because cute. like she's uncannily oh, like my, my grandma wow. so trying, so. To get a, trying to get a brother teary on <laughs> <See>? <laughs> and so like it's, it's, it's it, and so that that's the cool thing like mm-hmm. and again like and then the, the great thing then when you do that like it's it's nice and indulgent for personal reasons that like you have a connection you can you can you know heal little things but uh it gives a specificity to storytelling mm. that nothing else like if you're just doing the genre greatest hits you mm. can't really have that specificity that it, you know um that you can even on whatever modest scale i mean you know like it, it doesn't but if, if something's very specific and, and true, like I, I, it helps the performers because right. they because it has an inner integrity. Yeah, I think it, it helps the storytelling. It, mm-hmm. it it helps. It can make things a little bit more alive. So it's like, oh, I've seen that scene before. I have seen that scene before. What's uh, the difference between authenticity and on the nose? Because on the nose is bad. Oh yeah. But authenticity. <laughs> well, is I, good. I mean, I mean, I, I, that's a great question. Um, on the nose is something that Hank. Um, this episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner. Or at John LG69. At the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. What's uh, the difference between authenticity and on the nose? Because on the nose is bad. Oh yeah. But authenticity. Well, is I, good. I mean, I mean, I, I, that's a great question. Um, on the nose is something that Hank. Um, too familiar is the first thing that always comes. Yeah, to it's me. too familiar, and and, yeah. and, and uh, broadcasts too directly its intentions. Right. In a way, so like somebody's feeling sad and they walk outside and it starts raining, you know, like it's especially like, procedural. You see it in procedurals. You know, yeah. So it's like, it's lot. on the nose. It's too, there's no, it, like it, there's, there's something, you know, authentic has, um, an inner integrity, okay. uh, to it, I think, or has a, an, un, an, an unexpectedness that doesn't feel trivial. It feels mm. right in a way. Mm. Um, while like, I think things that are on the nose are like, they do nothing other than to, it's almost rhetorical. It broadcasts, mm this is how you should interpret this moment mm-hmm. as opposed to kind of letting the emotion or the intent kind of be, um, organic. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Well, you guys did a lot of this in Longmire with the different characters and their struggles with alcohol or, yeah, you yeah. know, all the different, they were all fighting something. It seemed like, and you could definitely be like right on the nose. And I can't remember all the characters names, but the, the guy <laughs> that was maybe going to have a baby with Vic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like he was, you know, he became something, you know, it's like we introduced this guy and you could have made him on the nose like he's going to be this. But he wasn't. He yeah. was much more complex than that. Yeah. No, I think um, uh, Travis is the Travis. Right? Yeah. yeah. And part of that is to say, like, well, we had a fantastic actor, Derek Phillips from mm-hmm. Friday Night Live mm-hmm. um, in that role. But it's also like I mean, that, that was one of my favorite characters to write because he, he gets you know, he's he kind of got introduced like he was originally just going to be a one-off uh, character. Like he's like Branch's old football buddy who's mm-hmm. now, or his old, maybe football. And, and he also has been a rodeo, but he's struggling and stuff. And so, and he's a little bit 
of a dick. And then, um, <laughs> but then, you know, we're just like, well, we happen to cast a great actor there. He's in this world. And then, so then he just, we, we kept on trying to find reasons to bring that, um, really that actor back in mm-hmm. a lot of ways. And so then you're just like, well, if he comes back to the one, same one note, that's going to be, that's going to be boring. And so mm-hmm. how can we kind of find, you know, something that doesn't contradict what came before, but where's the humanity in this guy? What's going to be yeah. unexpected? What's going to be the, the thing that's, that we're not expecting to see from him, but isn't arbitrary or random, but it's just like, okay, like this is a guy who's like, he's got an overprotective mom. Mm -hmm. He's been, you know, uh, he's been kind of disappointed with himself in his life and he's looking, but he's seen this pregnancy and with Vic, even though it was just a one night stand, uh, maybe this is a chance for him to finally step up and be a man. And so Mm -hmm. he's going to, he's going to, he wants to make that leap, but she's not so sure about it. And so like you, you, you get that and then it's like, oh, well that's relatable life. You know, I've been in this moment where I'm kind of like, oh, I'm, I'm kind of being a fuck up, and some X happens, and like I, I either gotta like you know raise my game up, or I'm gonna continue being a fuck up and disappoint people. Yeah. You know, and so you can bring a little bit of that, that to it. And so like that's the, uh, I mean, I think that's the, you gotta have a little bit of like emotional skin in the game on, you know, like probably you know as many characters as you can. Some right. aspect of yourself is there. Some or something you fear about yourself, or something you want to be, or whatever the and, case and, is. And we were tapping into that earlier about how you have to be, if you ever feel like you're, you're, you're for instance, he's writing some really cool military things right yeah. now, for example. Yeah. So I was telling him, I was like, now I realize when it comes to the military, there's lots of things you can't, because he comes from them, he, there's yeah. things you can't say. Yeah. But yeah. you have to come right up to the line. Yeah. You know, yeah. you so that so that so that we feel the onti- the authenticity yeah. of it, yeah. but it also is real and true to the people who are in there. Yeah. So they don't so they don't feel like oh you exposed oh, yeah, yeah. something, but oh man that really yeah that's really what happens. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So anytime you hold back because you're worried about it yeah. is when you're not being authentic. Yeah, yeah. But if you could take it to the line, yeah, yeah. then you know. Yeah. You know, you're yeah. doing okay. Yeah. No, totally. And, and and that's sometimes you know when you're writing a story where you have characters kind of inspired by real life people but right. you can't really like use them you know but you want to have that that specificity or something unique to them without them saying wait that's me i'm gonna sue you, <laughs> you <know? laughs> exactly, exactly. Which is not, but but it's that but but also like if you don't if you don't bring something of the real world to it and, and i mean that's the thing you can tell like movies or scripts written by people who've um only uh they're 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 just quotes of other movies right yeah i think that was like, sometimes I think about, like, you know, what if I would have started this career coming out of college instead mm-hmm. of going down these other right. things? But I'm just like, well, then I would have just been like every you other that experience. person. Like, right. I wouldn't have mm-hmm. I wouldn't have had a point of view, mm-hmm. wouldn't have had um, a, a, a wide, weird range of experiences. Right. And also, like, you know, being a poet, nobody, nobody gives a shit. So you've got to, like, the writing itself has to be its own reward because it right. sure as hell is not the money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not um, social status, uh, you know, and, like, maybe once you're past 25, chicks aren't impressed anymore either <laughs> or <laughs> whoever you're wanting to impress. Yeah. Right. That's, it becomes a little sad maybe to them. And so it's got to be the actual writing that mm-hmm. um, sustains you. And so, like, the great thing then is, like, you um, develop a relationship to writing and to your own inner voice and to your own kind of inner sensor. Mm-hmm. And then if you if you get a couple lucky breaks and you're writing now for a month, you know, like the thing is like, like I, I still like, like I write, you know, like I, I write, you know, working on a show now, work on other things, but I'm also always writing my own things right. just because I have How in the world do you find time when you're like producing a freaking show? Uh, or do you well, just try to squeeze well, it when, in? When, when, when I had my own show mm-hmm. uh, on, on Damnation, which I was show running, right. I couldn't do anything else. Than yeah, that. I, All I could do was, because like, you know, there's the writer's room, there's the scripts, there's prep, right. there's filming, and there's posts, and they're all going on at the same time. Like you're literally working on eight episodes. At the so they're finally time. about to air? Um, it's going to, it, so it aired on USA, okay. um, last November right. through January, got canceled. Right. That's uh, what I, I knew then, something was a twist. And then, uh, yeah, that's the, <laughs> that's, that's the act five surprise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, always a delight. And right. then, but it's going to be airing, uh, it's, it's going to, you know, now that the one year window is up, it will now be, uh, have its afterlife on Netflix starting oh. November 7th, which I'm excited about. So like now people who didn't catch it. Right. Uh, yeah. On USA now it's just you know because it was a co-production with Netflix is uh, internationally on Netflix already 
but it'll be available on the U.S. And so many people find things on streaming, right. stuff they didn't catch the first time. And so, like, I'm excited. Like, now it gets to have a second life. Tell the people what Damnation is about. Damnation is, and, and um, so it's set in the 1930s. Mm-hmm. Uh, the way I always uh, discuss it is like it's one third a Clint Eastwood western, uh, one third John Steinbeck novel, mm-hmm. one third a James L. Roy paranoid mm-hmm. thriller mm-hmm. type of thing. So Fantastic. like, uh, and so either you like that thing or you fall asleep. But you know, so basically, <laughs> it's set in the middle of Iowa. Um, there's two um, two men. One is a guy with a violent past named Seth Davenport, who's posing to, as a preacher, and mm-hmm. he's essentially trying to create. Um, class warfare mm. and um and create basically a uh, second civil war in the middle of the heartland lots of this is based inspired by true events going mm-hmm. on in iowa at the time then there's a second man still named going Kurt. on mm-hmm. yeah yeah no <laughs> hasn't all quite been worked out yet um <laughs> then there's a second man named creeley <laughs> turner who works for the pinkerton detective agency which you may know from the old west days but right. in the 30s was basically doing strike breaking for hire they go in and beat the shit out of organized labor mm-hmm. and stuff he's been sent to iowa to stop this man and what people don't know is that these two uh share a bloody past okay. and so it's very much like okay heart uh it's a battle for the heart and soul of the country uh in the middle of farm country prohibition is going on so there's all that kind of stuff going on and then we find out what's these two guys story how are they re- uh how are they related to each other and what their past is and how things are going to work out here's something interesting <laughs> mm. I know I'm talking a lot, but forgive me. Yeah. I don't want to talk at all. This is fascinating to me. They always tell you <laughs> a couple things never to write. Uh-huh. Anything historic yeah. and anything Western. Yeah. Huh. And you know how to mix the both of them. Yeah, which is no, really, really interesting. I, and and we got and we probably why we got canceled that one. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, I mean you know, like uh I had this idea. For it. And I was, uh, I was having breakfast with my agent, mm-hmm. and we're sitting there, and it's like, yeah, Jill, I've got this awesome idea for uh, a TV show, like, uh, Angus Cassette, 1930s, farming community. <laughs> He's a 19 what? <laughs> <laughs> 1930s, farming community. It's got real, like, you know, uh, themes about, you know, labor and class, and I think maybe we could do it in black and white. <gasps> and she does oh an actual God. spit take. <laughs> <laughs> and she's just like, so, just so you know, Tony, like... That's the least commercially promising idea I've ever heard. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, like, you can't pitch that. Right, right. But if you really believe in it. It's tortilla flat. Right. It's Howard yeah. Zinn. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, um, like, if you can get it on the page, yeah, maybe we could tell it. It's right? one, but, yeah, no. Um, and <laughs> so it. she's just like, yeah. But, you know, if you write it and it's entertaining and it's interesting and stuff, I'll try to sell it. Yeah, you know, it, I like really her. Believe it. Yeah, That's no, good. it's awesome. Yeah. yeah, and so I'm saying, okay, I'll, you know, and so this is why I'm working on Longmire. It's my passion project mm-hmm. thing, and so I wrote a couple episodes, and uh, and then we got a director involved, and we got other people, you know, and so then we went out and um, and and sold it, um, and somehow got it made. I mean, there's, I mean, you could write um, uh, a mini novel about the struggle about getting mm-hmm. a, a pilot, especially sure. from you know someone who's pretty anonymous, right. you know, to, to marshal these forces, these kind of financial, um, try to get the financial headwind and, the, you know, get people on board, get people excited. Because, like, it's, especially to do, period, like, that's that's a lot of fucking money. Very hard. I, yeah. wrote the, uh, I wrote the Black Wall Street movie. Oh, yeah. And, oh, it, and it's about the 1920s, and it's, yeah, it, 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 it's it, a lot it, of... In Tulsa? Or, yeah, Tulsa, yeah, Oklahoma. Yeah. It's been fascinating. So now I'm starting to get all these like opportunities to write all these other scripts yeah. around that. They were like, "Oh, he's the guy who's." And I'm like, "Oh yeah, totally. no, dude, I'm more than that. I'm more than." Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, yeah. But I found like, I mean, I was kind of. I mean, that's interesting because like, I'm only now starting to try to like, like I very like one thing I did catch on early mm-hmm. was that my biography was a little bit different, right? And it dovetailed nicely with that first script, and then I did Longmire, mm-hmm. and then and so like I became. For those who were interested, like, oh, this is the, this is the white trash <laughs> crime. This is Hollywood, guy. dude. They will you literally know? put you in that and, thing. Man. And it's so like, I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, I like, I like, you know, I like crime stuff. I yeah. like, you know, like, mm-hmm. I, I like white trash stuff. Um, I'll be that guy. <laughs> Embrace yeah. it. Yeah. All the and, way to the thing. So yeah. I will, I will make sure that they they know that element of my biography that you know, so they get that because like. You know they're cloistered away. They want they want to feel um, authenticity come in right. through the door. So you have you have an interesting 
you know, if you're trying to break in and you have an untraditional um, background, right. like embrace it. And if there's a story you want to tell in that, all the better because that confused and that, and then they know what to picture you. If they don't want to do that thing, if they have something kind of like that, right. which is, you know, that they want somebody for, where they can say, no, no, this person's the real deal. This person grew up in this world. Right. This person knows it inside and out. Mm-hmm. Be that person. Like, you know, like give them a, re- it's not, you don't just have to be, um, you it know, is your superpower. Good. Yeah. You know, yeah, really, no, absolutely. I, I, I was telling Pete, um, I believe we talked about this on your show a few months ago. There was an incident that happened. I was in the room, and I wonder if you can relate to this at all. Okay. Especially, like, this is my first time on, like, a network show. I've been in many smaller rooms, yeah. right? I'm sitting in the room, <clears throat> and two of the older writers are philosophizing about philosophy. It's not my shit. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And I find myself sitting there, and I start shrinking in the room. And I was getting imposter syndrome. Yeah. I literally was sitting there going, what the fuck am I doing yeah, here? Yeah. And I looked down at the table and open on the, on the table is our, you know, big book with all the comics in there. Yeah. And it's open on a page of this character that represents me. It's mm-hmm. a guy named Maude Steven. Mm-hmm. And I looked down at him and I looked around the table at all the writers and I went, oh, nobody else was there except for yeah. me. Yeah. In San Francisco. Yeah. In the eighties. Yeah. yeah. I was at Bad Brains. I was at yeah. Fishbone. I was yeah. at you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I was at the special. That was me. Yeah. And I went, Oh, okay, they can do whatever when it comes yeah. to that. Yeah. I got it. Yeah. You yeah. know? But it took me I was for five minutes, I was just like, <gasps> What am I doing here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And immediately I came out of that with even more power. Yeah. You know what no, I mean? No, and, and I think <clears throat> absolutely I mean I, I went through that as well. And so and then so much and, and weirdly like um, owning that insecurity, or mm-hmm. to or to find something from your, you're just like okay, like I'm being excluded because of my background, or mm-hmm. because I'm not in this club. Right. But then, but like almost like your purchase on the story or on your place in there is that exclusion right. in a way, and and bringing the thing, not not in a shitty way, but bringing the thing that other people can't, which is like experience, right. which is firsthand, um, uh, not just like firsthand observation, but also like the emotional um, path of being in that world right. or being this type of person in that world. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like I, I, I grew up in, in in this kind of blue collar, rural, tougher world. I'm not a tough guy. Mm-hmm. You know, I probably got born into the wrong world. I should have, you know, <laughs> I, I should, I'm, I'm happy in a library watching films. I'm a, I'm a cream puff type of guy, you know, but, uh, but I, I happened to grow up in this world. So right. I observed that. Then also I had to figure out coping strategies to be like, somebody in that world, not of that world. And so I can talk right, about, right. about that yeah. a little bit and talk, you know, and so it's like, if you can, if you can locate, you're kind of an underdog. I love that. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. You, you can locate your insecurities mm-hmm. and kind of own them in a way. And, and like, I always feel like whatever I'm insecure about, if I can share it and vocalize it, mm-hmm. like it's a lot less scary, mm-hmm. but it also, it's, it's a, it's a thing that's very specific to you. Like the mm-hmm. things that, and, and that if you can write about the things you're actually afraid about or tell stories, and being honest about that, like that, that's that, because so, so many people aren't. They want to be, like, and again, this is like you know, friends of mine that I, you know, their weakest scripts. They're still they're trying to be smarter than the story, or right. they're hovering, or they're outside it. They're like bird's eye view. They're never down the characters. Yeah. You never feel right. them um, put their own emotional or psychological mm-hmm. psychological state at risk. Right. Like you know, yeah. you, you need to like <laughs> almost feel like the script might just show too much of me of what I'm afraid of or what my, you know, mm-hmm. and if you can be in that state or at least mm-hmm. access it, cause like mm-hmm. you can't be in it all the time cause you'll just, you'll just, you know, melt. But it, but yeah. if you can access it either in a room or on the page, mm-hmm. that's, that does become your superpower. That right. becomes that thing, how to, how, how to cultivate that, maintain access of it while still being a functioning human being. Like right. that's, I think that's, that's sometimes the artist's, um, uh, kind of that, that that's the thing that you have to kind of learn um, right. among the things you have to master. I think. So I worked a lot in conflict zones, <clears throat> Afghanistan, that yeah. kind of thing. And I would go out into town and do a very similar thing where I would be, it's not discomfort, it's miscomfort. Yeah. Like yeah. I had to figure out what comfortable was in that Afghan world. Yeah. I'm not from that world, but yeah. I was in it. And then my job was to extract out what the reality was and give it, condense it down into a consumable package to mm the military so mm-hmm. i had to like hop and he into studied a, human behavior all day long you had yeah, to yeah yeah and, yeah and but i had to translate this is where i want to get to i had to translate what i saw and experienced to a totally different audience that couldn't accept 
Like, no, 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 there's no electricity here. Yeah. And they're like, ah, oh, my light just went on. There's not even electricity. We have to yeah. completely change our dynamic. But right. if I just came back and said, everything sucks, dig more wells, they yeah. would have said, yeah, dig more wells. But yeah. that wasn't about that. So I had to go into this reality, experience the discomfort, mm-hmm. understood, and bring that message out. That's almost a, the same thing that you're trying to yeah. do for your audience, right? Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Cause, yeah, you have to, like, not just take... The, not just document facts you mm-hmm. have to mm-hmm. like internalize the world the the world almost like I, I guess like the operational perspective that these facts um conjure or create you know and then take that and somehow translate this to people somewhere else so they right. can understand it so they can make because like so they they can adapt and understand that from the inside out and right. like that's i mean that's that's a big thing about like you know when you're telling the story like you you want you know uh, uh, a script to be an emotion or an empathy generating machine, but what y- it should be a ride. It should be like a yeah, but yeah. It, but it has to start with them able to put themselves in that person's place and to read situations mm-hmm. um, from their um, their point of view, so that mm-hmm. you know, like if you know, if at the beginning of the movie or the script, you know, you, you do that, and then at the, the very last scene, you know, they see a you know a window with a rubber ducky in it. And they start crying, and you start right, crying. Right. Like you, you know, like that first scene that would right. never mean anything. You have to set that up. Though. You have to set that up. <laughs> right. That's how you keep from being on the nose. Because right. if it's just up there and it's a, you know, it's a somebody hanging from a noose. Like, well, mm-hmm. you could have done that in the first scene. That's right. nothing specific. But if you built up, um, you know, it's like T. S. Eliot's objective correlative. Like mm-hmm. this means this. This means that. In this arrangement, and then you see something that right. would seem arbitrary, but at the end. It's like, oh no, the ducks and the the rubber duckies in the window. Mm-hmm. Oh my god, you know. And then then you've done something. Mm-hmm. Then you've created something very specific, and you've taken transported somebody from their own. Point That's of view, like the rosebud could... moment. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. exactly. Okay. Let, let me just ask you, since we're here, and I know we got to wrap up. Yeah. yeah. Um, since we're sitting here yeah. in your office in yeah. the 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 writers' room of Tara. Yeah. How did you come to that show? Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, well, you know, Damnation got canceled. I needed a job. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I was, you know, like, the nice, I mean, so it's, it's not that mercenary. It's like... Because um, they're two different shows. Two different shows. Right. And this is a new genre for me. Right. So, like, you know, Terror's elevated, uh, like, you know, so it's an anthology show. The first season, 1850s, like mm-hmm. a um, Arctic Explorers get um, stranded mm-hmm. and uh, and then they get kind of... Uh, it, it it becomes like and it's you know, a big cast, it's a big, big cast, yeah. and it's like you know like the thing meets Master and Commander. So mm-hmm. I mean, it's a very cool show. Yeah, our season's totally different. It's a totally yeah, new story. Yeah, this is really wild because uh, in our house we watched it and it would just ate it up because it, it's a thriller and you yeah. don't know what's going on, yeah. you don't know what's going to happen. Well, well, yeah. So the next season is the not next season, in the totally 1800s? new stories. No, totally new story oh, uh, following uh, a Japanese American community. Uh, from a fishing village through awesome. the, uh, through World War Two, uh, through internment camp um, into the w- uh, war into the Pacific and back into Oh, America. I'm so on that. So I love and, it. And, and yeah. there's like this otherworldly specter that's involved and that is 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 haunting uh, different people, and you've got to kind of right. figure out this whole story. So there's, mm. um, but yeah, so like I mean, it's it's one of those roundabout things. Like um, Damnation had originally sold to AMC, actually. Oh, really? um, and then they pass on it because it's between us and Preacher. Mm-hmm. Uh, you c- can't have two violent <laughs> Preacher shows on the same network. Uh, and then when they passed on us, uh, we went to USA. But I had a really good time developing the show with AMC. I like okay. the um, the executives. They seemed to like me. And so mm-hmm. after Damnation ended, it was like, uh, you know, like, um, met with them. Like, well, we'd still love to do something with you. And then the terror, uh, Alexander Wu is the, is the showrunner, co-creator, and when he's looking to fill out the room, I think both uh, AMC and then uh, Guy McCassidy, who's my manager, mm-hmm. is also an executive producer on the show. And so there's like, you know, well, maybe you should take a look at, at Tony. He might be a good match. And so they sent me the script. I loved uh, Alex's script for it. And mm-hmm. it was just, and it was, you know, like I love doing historical stuff. Mm-hmm. I love doing period stuff. It's hard mm-hmm. to get it on air. Uh, this is already on air. It's yeah. a chance to, right. to kind of do it again. And, and I like the story and it's different from what I'd done before. And so mm-hmm. I met with Alex and uh, I didn't scare him off. And so, <laughs> um, so we've been doing this now for like about four months. Wow. Um, yeah. Of kind of, because it's a, it's an ambitious story. I mean, it, it covers 
Pearl Harbor happens in um, the first episode. And, wow, and, really? Yeah, I mean, we don't film Pearl Harbor. Okay, okay. But, it, but, it ha- <laughs> but it happens. <laughs> it's been a bad drop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How do you guys deal with the leap, though? Like, so we're going to go from this British ship, a bunch of, you know, UK actors. It's, you just so, you just go. It's an anthology. Just do it? Yeah. Just anthology. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just like True Detective. Fargo, right. Okay. Um, what have you. Uh, and so, yeah, so there's no, you know. American no Horror real, Story, you just go. Yeah, right. like so the real continuity is just you know in success. I think the show would every season have you know it'd be kind of elevated horror and um, instead of just period horror, it's historical. So it's built sure. around some actual true life events, but there's a um, a kind of a horror spin on it. I didn't so, even realize this was an anthology. Yeah. So so we'll see. So, now I got to come on season three. I'm about to talk yeah, to you. Yeah, totally. Uh-oh. <laughs> and so we um, so we fall. You know, and it, it falls like five years. Like it. So it takes in like so much historical scope. And like this is mm-hmm. really the first time this has been tackled yeah. in this depth in, on TV. So we want to get this history right, but you're right. also you want to tell a gripping horror story. Mm-hmm. You know, and that that uh, is rewarding and. And telling a horror story, a serious horror story, over you know ten hours is very different than an hour and a half because right. like, you know, usually it's it's a it's a house or some contained right. yeah. you know and stuff like this is there's some sprawl and there's some I mean we're getting there but it's a real like you know, you pull one string or you take one thing out and other you know like it's calibrating mm. the historical and the horror and the character developments I mean hopefully those are all interwoven and we're trying yeah. working on that but yeah it's it's a um, it's where are you? Challenge. Can you say where you are in the script right now? Are you in? Well, we're. You guys still an outline form? Are you? We're in script. We're, we're script on most of the episodes. Mm-hmm. We have we have drafts done. And Which number are you? Uh, I'm two and co-writing seven. That is one of the hardest scripts to write. Is two. number two. Two is tough. That's two is tough. That's tough. Uh, why is two tough? Tell them why. Tell them why. I'll tell them why. Well, well, one, you're introducing all the characters. And you're introducing the world, and you have, and but two. Two is almost in a way you're reintroducing the dynamics from one, but you're also you're moving the story forward. Um, also, as a one has, it's it's like almost like the first album, second album thing. Like mm-hmm. first, the pilot's really been thought through. The character's been thought through. It's written. They've had a sh- lot of time. Show yeah, of time. Yeah, sure. And so then you come in. You know, I come in from the outside. Like this uh, pilot had been developed. Yeah, I don't know how long I was involved until after it got the green light, but. Mm-hmm. Um, but you come in and you try to like bring up, bring in their voice. Yeah. So you try to learn their voice, right. these characters' voices, the showrunners' voice, uh, while bringing your own element to it and while pushing the story forward. It's a, it's it's a tr- it's a tricky thing. It's the because yeah. uh, because things need to be escalating, but they can't be escalating s- or uh, so much that you lose people. Like right. it's it's a like um, like uh, episode two on, on damnation, even though I, I wrote the first three episodes, two mm-hmm. is the trickiest. Huh. Um, it's also, it's also the, if you don't mind me interrupting, <laughs> I think it also <laughs> tends to be that you come into the room. So you've written the pilot, you bring the room in, everybody comes in and then you work for like a month or two, just developing like what the whole series could be, even though you have ideas, yeah. but it changes with yeah. all these people in a room. So now you got to write that episode two to the pilot that is, kind of different now yeah <laughs> to some and, extent yeah you know what i mean and, and and in a lot of right. ways pilots i mean if you're smart about it, you're writing you're writing a pilot thinking about episode 50 right. uh, episode yeah. 75 like, and you're writing the pilot just so the thing can exist yeah mm-hmm. so you throw it like in the pilot you throw everything you can like this oh what if we have this plot twist and stuff mm-hmm. then episode two is when the uh you know everything comes home to roost yeah where you actually <laughs> have to like oh shit like now you know, like damnation, like the the twist in the last scene is that the, the two guys are brothers. Yeah. Right. Okay. And like part of that was just like, okay, like I think that's that was part of the conception, but I throw that in, and like people are gonna be, okay, great, what's gonna happen with them as brothers? And then like, oh god, we got, uh, <laughs> really, what is their life together as brothers? <laughs> right. You know, or like you know, it and, was cute and, on the page, it was right? on the page <laughs> and it's great in the pilot. And it's just like, oh yeah, it suggests all yeah. these rich right. things, and then you actually have to like follow through on it on right. two yeah. while still laying groundwork for three, four, five, you know, so it's like, like for me on two, like, um, it's been, it's been trying to move uh, on the terror, like the, the script from being basically laying the groundwork for future episodes mm. to being in and of itself, a compelling hour of television. Mm-hmm. Cause like, cause like, it, it, cause like, you know, you, you have this whole plan and this, I, I see a lot of people have this problem. Like you have this whole plan for the whole season where everything climaxes in 10, right. but if if people aren't hooked by the end of one or in the mm-hmm. middle of two, like who cares? Like you could have the most amazing <laughs> yeah. Sopranos thing on ten. Mm-hmm. If everybody's tuned out, 
you know what was that you know so you gotta like it's get that right balance mm-hmm. but if you like shoot the um story um juice in uh yeah, two <laughs> um then then you, you can't shoot too much of it just you know because then you have nowhere to go you, right. you know so it is it's a it, it's a tricky little uh, it is thing. tricky you're right because we watched uh we binge watched that new julia roberts uh oh, Amazon homecoming. Show. Uh-huh, homecoming, yeah. and we just barely got over the hump oh yeah just barely yeah. It's you know a little slow pace wait, wait, little which, slow. Which, which episode got you pulled in uh i think we just we didn't have a whole lot to do yeah. If we had something else to do, yeah. we might have, but we were like, eh, you know, yeah, yeah. you know, the whole 15 seconds later it starts, you're like, ah, yeah. let's just see what happens, yeah, you know? Yeah. But I bet, I bet if we had had a different weekend organized, yeah. we might have not made it through it, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's weird how, like, I, I kind of never cared about her character. Really? I, I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. I, I, I want to so, see it, because, like... And it's excellent. I mean, they get you there at the end, but it, yeah. it took, it was a lot of work. Had, did you know the podcast, or were you going to? I know, never I did. did, never yeah. knew. Anything I listened about to it. all of the shows. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. just a podcast head, so yeah. I love it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I need to check it out. I, I mean, that's one of the tough things when you're working on a show. Like you, uh, it's hard. You know, mm-hmm. no, it's it's hard to you can't keep up really. Like, no. especially when I'm working on a show, like I don't even try to keep up. I just, I, I put in mo- usually movies that I think will keep me inspired right yeah it keep me excited because you got to stay in their heads but you got to keep coming up with pictures you got to keep yeah. you know what i mean it's yeah. difficult yeah. Keep, what know, movie difficult. keeps you inspired what can you always put in unforgiven oh, oh that's okay that's movie. perfect you know, uh la confidential sure yeah. um, so some shitty movies some good some yeah. good yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, is cur- unforgiven the best western ever do you think it's uh it's my second favorite uh, silverado yeah uh <laughs> <laughs> Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, Sam Peckinpah. Okay, that's, yeah. that's my favorite Western. Right. Yeah. Um, but uh, Unforgiven's right up there. There's a Korean film called Memories of Murder that, uh-huh. I, um, mm. that I really love. Uh, yeah. Mills Crossing is probably my favorite movie. All right. But it, some of it just depends too. Like you know, like doing the terror now. Like I've really gone on a, um, a horror. You got to be in the horror, definitely. Yeah, because like I mean, yeah. you, 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 I, I mean, I, to me, it'd be the height of arrogance to think I could come in and, <laughs> you know, help tell a really great horror story right. and not be, you know, like that, that, you know, that's, that's another thing I think I carried over from academia is just like a perpetual student mentality, which right. I yeah. think is, is serving me well so far, both mm-hmm. like, you know, like when I'm on set, I, I'm there as a producer, but I'm also there to just like learn what people's jobs are, but what they need, how things, because you know, like part, you know, like yeah. you're there to like. You're a manager. You you're have ma- to manager you're a leader. And, and, and right. if you, yeah, if you right. don't know what people need or what they want or what gets in their way, you can't really help them. Yes. It's you one have to thing. think like a fish. Yeah, you have to, right. totally. If you walk, right. just walk in there and just like, oh, like I'm just here to feel like a big shot, or I'm here to like, tell, you know, like you, <laughs> I'm gonna sit by, yeah, then, and watch. Then, then, the, then, <laughs> no. the sh- then the show's <laughs> exactly. the show's serving you. You're not right. serving the show, like right. you know. And so like, if you go in with that student mentality, I feel like yeah. you can kind of, you know, keep. Uh, uh, right. Keep deepening your skill set and your perspective. So you guys got to check out Tony Toast's work. It's fantastic. Longmire is great. Right. I mean, I can't wait to see the new Terror season. It's yeah. going to be so much more fun now to watch it and like, you know, just watch it with you. Yeah, you know, it, yeah. it's. I'm so looking forward to yeah. it. And Damnation I, coming on Netflix soon. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think you know if there's yeah if, if people give Damnation a chance, I think uh, you know maybe it'll hook you hopefully by. Episode two or three. All right. Maybe. All right. Maybe, or maybe the pilot. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. I don't want to be you know, yeah. presumptuous. When's it out on Netflix? Uh, uh, November 7th, Wednesday. That's in America. It's, it's already America. out. It's, yeah. it's already out globally. What yeah. a great thing Netflix is, too, because not only a second life, but maybe even a bigger life, you yeah, know, a lot no, of times. No, absolutely. I, I think, I think and, and because I think it's a co-production, I don't think we have, like, you know, some shows, like, their license deal runs up, right. and then they just kind of disappear mm-hmm. or whatever, you know, or some shows get forgotten because they're not mm-hmm. accessed on streaming, and so, right. so I think, like, that's one thing I'm excited about. You know, I, I love, like, you know, finding hidden gems and stuff, and, and you know, you, you always want, you want to write, like, a big hit show, but yeah. you have hit, big Speaking hit show. Speaking of that, I know you're down with Godless. Godless? Yeah. No, because I mean, I I, I haven't. I, <laughs> okay, I gotta know what you think about that when I, you watch I, it. Yeah, I, I haven't seen because of. I mean, that's part of the. You thing. gotta watch that one because yeah. it is so it's brilliant. It's so close to. Um, yeah, it's the same reason I didn't watch Preacher. Okay. Because I didn't. Right. I didn't. You want, don't want to be influenced by it. I didn't want. Yeah, right, I didn't want right, to right. accidentally internalize. Like I just I, did. If if I'm gonna steal shit, I'm gonna steal from the sixties <laughs> and seventies. You know, maybe there's a little. Yeah, you know, then it could be an homage. Right. You know, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> and I'm I'm Hilliard Guest. Uh, you guys can check me out. Screenwriters Rant Room, January sixteenth. You guys can check out Deadly Class dropping. And I got two big projects coming very very soon. 
Can't talk about them, but yeah. it's about to drop. That's, that's always kind of it. You want to cut, you want to. I'm like, go, oh, I want to tell, tell you tell guys. People, but you're just like, I can't, I can't, I can't. Yeah. yeah. No, totally. Yeah. It's fun talking about this shit. Um, Thank you. See, it wasn't bad, was it? We just had no, a conversation. No, you guys were gentle, sweet. <laughs> oh, and you can find me, Hilliard Guess, on Twitter, and Screenwriters RR on Twitter. Yeah. Pete A. Turner on Twitter, and then you're Tony Toss, right? Toast. Toast. I Tony always want to say ah. I know, well, I'm a big dummy, it was, you know, it was, it was, Tony Toast. It was Toast of Vershnik several generations ago. Ah, so uh-huh. it was something else. It was, okay. but, uh, yeah. but now it's Tony Toast. Tony Toast, which uh, kind of sounds a little bit like a superhero. Uh, <laughs> and are you on Twitter? I am at, on Twitter at T-O-N-Y, T-O-S-T. Awesome. Tony Toast. Tony Toast. I've, uh, awesome. Yeah. Well, good. We'll be doing <laughs> that, then. <Okay. laughs> All right. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. All right. You. Thanks, Pete. Thank you. Thank you, man.